Hello everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a mustached friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful walrus. Some animals just don't seem to fit either furry, scaly, or slimy, and so you must wait to find out why they are our mustached friends. This, of course, is a very special listener episode dedicated to Madeline, who wrote in and requested this amazing creature. I believe it is increasingly more of a challenge to only have one person to shout out on a particular episode, and so Madeline, I hope you enjoy yours. For how to request your very own episode and for all of the facts that were used in this one, you can go to the show notes or the description where it is immediately available to you, or you can wait until the end in which I will tell you all of these things. If you want to start your very own podcast about animals or whatever it be, I have written a book called Anyone Can Talk, which is available in the description. You can also support the show through Patreon if you so choose. And now, let us begin to slow down a little bit. We have to first do some preparation before we go straight into our journey. As always, I have three primary exhortations for you. My first exhortation to you is to bring your favorite pair of winter boots as well as your favorite winter jacket. We are definitely going to need those where we are going. And the second thing I exhort you to do is to recognize perhaps where you are carrying tension. This portion is so unique to everybody in the sense that somebody might notice that their shoulders are always up or maybe they carry tension in their hands like I do. But regardless of wherever that tension is, my exhortation is the same. Try to bring up in your mind something of a piece of jello and I encourage you to do your best to do a kind of jello impersonation really shoot for an Oscar nomination here. That is to say, relax your body as best as you can. I just find that Jell-O helps give almost a visual cue as to what we are exactly shooting for. And lastly, give your mind permission to wander and journey with me into the shallow continental shelf of the Chukchi Sea where the walrus resides. Listen to the crisp crunching of the snow beneath your feet. Hear the wind instrument that is the would-be harsh arctic wind, but to us may be something like a summer breeze with all of our layers on. And what could make this natural orchestra better than the accompaniment of the bellows of the walrus? We are where we are today because we are learning about the walrus, and in specific, the Pacific walrus. This particular walrus has a wide range between Russia and the United States, that being, of course, Alaska, and we could have been nearer to the Laptev Sea or to the Bering Sea, and these are all wonderful places to visit, but today we are in one of the most popular spots for the Pacific walrus. We will cover the differences between the subspecies of walrus in just a moment. But the reason we are here in particular is because it ticks all of the boxes for the small ecological niche in which the walrus thrives. They love shallow water with depths of only about 80 meters or 262 feet. And these shallow waters also sport a variety of food for the walrus, including many kinds of mollusks. And while the walrus will be spending most of its time in these shallow waters, they also have a quick and reliable passage to the open water in case they need it. 
There's also the benefit of having these sort of ice shelves or ice chairs that they can prop themselves up on that give quick and easy access back into the water in case they need to escape. And so that is why we are here specifically, but we could be in other places, for example, like Canada. If we were to delve more into the Atlantic walrus, we could go to Canada, to Greenland, to Norway, and also to Russia. But we must leave that for another time. The creature we are looking at today has the common name of walrus, which is the one that we all know, and I dare say that we all know and love. The scientific name perhaps sounds a little bit more cryptic at first, but after a bit of explanation will make a lot of sense. It is the Autobenus rosmaris. These of course are two Latin words, but the Latin is coming from an earlier Greek. Autobenus is a compound of two different words, one being tooth and another being go or to walk. And altogether, the scientific name of the walrus means tooth-walking seahorse. I believe personally that the walrus is deserving of no less than this whimsical distinction. Have you ever thought about a walrus as a tooth-walking seahorse? Well, perhaps the researchers at first did, and I have no problem carrying on that tradition. The latter word of rosmarus is one that was imported from a Scandinavian word rather than from a Greek word directly. The Scandinavian peoples seemed to have called the walrus something akin to a red whale, calling to their cinnamon color among certain walruses, but not all of them. The walrus is a mammal. We take many of these words for granted, so let me just simply define it. A mammal is a warm-blooded vertebrate, and a vertebrate being an animal with a backbone, and something is called a mammal when it has hair or fur and also able to give milk to their young. And the last distinction of mammals is that they typically give birth to live young. There are no eggs here or some other kind of process, and so I hope that helps. This animal is a powerful one. They can weigh up to one and a half tons, that's about 2,000 pounds, or just over 900 kilograms. To ground that in something we might know, that is about the weight of a small car. This creature is not going to fit in a handbag and is much bigger than us. They will be between 7.25 to 11.5 feet in length. The combination of their density and of their size in terms of their length makes them for quite an astonishing sight. And so now that we have some of this general background information, let's go a little bit deeper into what makes the walrus oh so wonderful. The Pacific walrus that we are looking at more so today has a population size about eight times more than that of the Atlantic. This doesn't seem to be because the Atlantic walrus has a smaller geographical range, and so I am not exactly sure why that is. But walruses, in general, are typically a cinnamon brown color, hence why maybe the Scandinavian peoples termed them red whales. But keep in mind that some of the ones we're looking at, we'll notice, are not exactly that cinnamon brown color. Some of them look to be more of a white or even a pink color. This will be because of different factors. Some of them will turn more white after they have just been diving. Some of them are pink because of how warm they are. Certain physiological and environmental factors can play into the color that we're seeing right now. But we'll notice that due to heat or certain conditions that their color changes. And so we know that this has something to do with their ability to differentiate or to vary their own blood supplies, because of course, with blood brings heat. And so under certain circumstances, where their blood go will change, sometimes more to the peripheries, giving them more of that pinkish color, and sometimes more central, giving them that more whitish or grayish color. And one thing we'll notice is that the size of their head is 
not all that proportional to their body. Their heads are in fact quite small. But on this relatively small head, they have these colorless whiskers and these very large tusks, which give them most of their popularity. So what exactly are these tusks for? Well, their tusks will of course provide them with some kind of an advantage in the area in which they live. Their tusks will be used something like a pick is used if somebody were to climb the side of an icy mountain. It will be used to haul their huge bodies outside of the water onto the land or the ice. Driving their tusks into the land gives them an anchor point by which they can pull themselves up. Of course, reaching back to their scientific name of tooth-walking seahorses, we can see why they would be given that distinction given this amazing behavior. They will also use their tusks to drive through the ice and give them a breathing hole. They are these little arctic excavators. Maybe using the word little is not the right word, but they are certainly arctic excavators. The tusks are not specific to males or females, but are found in both. And given their smaller sized head relative to the rest of their body, their three foot tusks really steal the show. The tusks are in fact large canine teeth that will continuously grow throughout their lives. There is not a portion in which their tusks simply stop growing, but rather it is one long continuous process that only stops once the animal is no longer living. But given the sharp nature of their tusks, they do not only use it to excavate and to prop themselves up onto the sea ice, they will use their sharp tusks aggressively against one another, specifically in defense of territories, and this kind of behavior will peak during mating season in which males are competing with one another. We'll get more into that in just a moment. So we can see that their tusks are really great for where they are. So let's get into one of their other very specialized features. If I may be so bold, I believe that the walrus has one of the most legendary mustaches in the animal kingdom. Now you might be surprised to find out that the mustaches are not just for making them terribly handsome, but rather they serve a very important purpose and that is the purpose of detection. As walruses will dive deep sometimes, and the ocean gets darker and darker, their sensitive whiskers can be employed as these detectors, not for metal or something else, but rather they will give them extremely sensitive reception as to what is happening on the floor of the sea. These extremely sensitive whiskers that they have are also called by a fancy name, which is mustachial vibrisi. Discerning things in the darkness is a lot easier when you have these whiskers. The depths at which they will dive to will be up to 80 meters or 262 feet, but the majority of their feeding will occur between 10 and 50 meters, which is about 33 to 164 feet. They will tend not to dive to their capacity because of the energy that it takes, and normally, in the environment in which they are in, plenty of resources and food can be found before that depth. So while they will not employ their whiskers as much, as long as they have their eyesight to rely on, when it gets just a little bit too murky, those mustaches will come in super handy. Once they have found some mollusks, for example, with the help of those whiskers, they will use their front flippers almost as a broom to sweep away any soft material, so then they are able to go in there and eat the meat that is inside the shell. While this is a remarkable mechanism employed by the walrus, I am glad it is not something we as humans need too much indulge in. I, for one, would be quite disturbed to see my father trying to navigate the living room without the lights on, using only his mustache. And so I say, and hopefully you say with me, let us leave that to the walrus. One other very specialized feature of the walrus is their capacity for slowing down their heartbeats. 
with a very slow heartbeat, they will be able to withstand polar temperatures of the surrounding water and be able to be underwater for much longer. We learned earlier that they are warm-blooded creatures. Well, how, of course, we have to ask, do they stay warm? In order for warm-blooded creatures to stay warm, which the walrus is, and actually which we are, is a continual process that uses the energy that we consume. So to keep this process of keeping the blood warm, there must be a continuous process also of eating. So in order for this process of continuous warming to happen, there must be also a process of continuous eating or ingestion of energy as well. Their body, which is lined with blubber, which is kind of a natural insulation, one of nature's best fur coats, if we want to call it that, equips the walrus to really live in some of the harshest conditions on Earth. The coats that we are wearing now with our multiple layers are nothing in comparison to the insulated blubber that coats the entirety of the walrus's body. This is why they do not need jackets, and we do. If we all had these huge stores of blubber, I imagine living in places like Florida, California, or let's say even Spain, would simply be much too warm. If that were the case, about 88% of Canada which is currently uninhabited, would be much more habited. Places like Canada, which as it currently stands is around 88% uninhabited, would be a much more comfortable place to live. But as it stands in reality, we are not lined with such blubber stores and so people tend to prefer less of a very harsh climate. Now this may come as somewhat of a shock or a surprise, but the body of the walrus is technically streamlined. What I mean by streamlined is that their body makes it very easy to swim and conserve heat at the same time. This is due to the fact that walruses have a very small surface to volume ratio, along with body parts that do not protrude every which way, but rather allow them to glide quite easily in the water and all of the limbs of the walrus are sleek and webbed. This gives them feet or forelimbs and hind limbs that are like that of oars that we might use in a canoe or in a kayak. So this up to one and a half ton creature can swim up to 35 kilometers an hour, around 22 miles per hour if it has been startled and is fleeing. One and a half tons of blubber and tusk zooming out of there so quickly. This is what I mean by having a streamlined body. And as we are staring at the walruses, we ought to notice their form of locomotion or how it is they even move around on land. Well, their oar-like hind and forelimbs cannot be used to stand upright, and so they move in that very characteristic walrus-like locomotive pattern, which is like a thrust forward with their body in these short bursts or lunges, and so they are essentially scooching or scooting forward. And the reason they can do this comfortably is because also of that blubber that we learned about. The blubber will not only act as a fur coat or as an insulator for heat, but it will also act something like pillows on the outside of their body. We must remember that the environment in which they are throwing their bodies around is ice. It can be sharp and uneven and hard, and their blubber will cushion them as they hit the ice with different parts of their body. Now this might not be the most energy efficient way of getting around, but they have no other choice and must expend the energy in this way to get from point A to point B while on land. The walrus can live up to about 40 years of age. And as we scan the vast crowd of walruses now, we may even be able to distinguish the age of an older walrus to a younger one. This is because many of the older walruses will show their age physically. These physical markers won't be things like wrinkles, 
but rather scars that tell a story of their previous disputes with their fellow walruses. As we learned before, males during the breeding season can be quite violent to one another. And so typically, the more scars you see on a walrus are indicative of more battles, more fights, and so a higher age. And this arctic breeze has the potential to be very cold. But as we are scanning this herd, we are actually taking one thing for granted, and that is that they are in herds to begin with. We have learned about many creatures that prefer more of a solitary lifestyle, but the walrus clearly does not. Bunching up close together, something like penguins can help them withstand those very cold temperatures. And on a physiological level, they can withstand freezing temperatures as low as negative 31 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 35 degrees Celsius. I think there have been a few days in Canada in which the wind chill will reach that level, but suffice to say that whenever there are days like that, I just prefer to stay home. One other thing that I took for granted was that the name of a group of walruses are called a herd. When they congregate in these large numbers, as they always do, these are called herds. And herds usually have some kind of a strict partition that segregates the males from the females. Each will have their own herd, each will have their own group. And the female walruses on the female side of the herd are very protective of their calves. Their calves are, of course, their baby walruses. The mother walrus will pick up her calf in her flippers and then hold the calf to her chest tightly before diving into the water to escape any kind of predation. It is very uncommon for a mother walrus to just escape without her calf. This is because when they do have young, they have them sparingly or fairly infrequently. And so this child for the mother is very vital and she will feel the need to protect her offspring from whatever threats are in the environment. As far as natural predators go, orcas and polar bears are really their only natural predators. But outside of these natural predators come of course human beings which are the primary predators of creatures like this, at least in a historical sense. Now as far as herds go, the largest walrus herd in Canada occurs in the Fox Basin. And so while right now we are in Alaska, we don't need to travel that far to get to this place. While today we are in Alaska on this continental shelf, we'll be able to go see the mighty walrus. So perhaps one day as a Canadian, I will have to travel to see the mightiest walruses in Canada. The last fact before the name of the walrus is a testament to just how much they eat. In one single feeding session, not a feeding season, but one feeding session, they will eat between 3,000 to 6,000 clams. They are an all-you-can-eat restaurant's worst nightmare. And now let us move on to the name of the animal, walrus. What does that name mean or where does it come from? It is today used to describe a large, pinniped, carnivorous mammal, and that word has been used that way since the 1650s, and it comes from the Dutch word walrus. And all of the roots seem to go back to a Scandinavian word of some sort, coming from perhaps Old Norse, or Old English, or Finnish, but it seems to go back to an Old Norse word which I will not even try to pronounce. It seems clear that the Scandinavian peoples had a hold on the walrus before most of us did. And the charity for this episode is actually twofold. There are two separate charities in which you can quote-unquote adopt a walrus. But keep in mind when these websites say that you can adopt a walrus, it is strictly a symbolic thing. You are not adopting an actual walrus named Ted, for example. But organizations or foundations like WWF and the National Wildlife Federation have options for people to adopt a walrus. Basically, after you give your donation, that donation goes to the specific cause of helping walruses. Again, that is WWF or National Wildlife Federation. 
So now let us move on to the review portion of the show. This review comes from LERC74, who is writing all the way from the United States of America. I am just going to call this person Lurk for short. And Lurk writes, I can't do meditation podcasts, and I like learning things from a podcast, even when I'm trying to relax, preferably spoken by a calm voice. This checks every box, and if I fall asleep, even better. It's the best talk-to-you-sleep podcast, and maybe you'll learn something. Love it. Keep up the hesitant whispering of facts, please. Night-night. Thank you, Lurk, for such an abundance of kind words. I am so happy that you enjoy the show and that it ticks every box for you. I'm grateful for your listenership, and I will do my best to keep up my hesitant whispering of facts. If the show helps you at all and you want to give back to the show, one of the biggest ways you can do so is by leaving a review. It doesn't even have to be a five-star review if you do not choose it to be so. I have learned so much from the one star, the two star, the three, the four, all of your feedback and the things that you like and don't like about the show are very important to me and to the show's growth. Alternatively, if you are listening on Spotify or on another platform in which you do not have a review button, rating, following, subscribing, or even sharing it to your friends or on social media, these are all things that truly make a difference in the growth of the show. If you would like to request your very own episode, you can do so by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and clicking on the Animal Request tab. To reach out to me, Steph Wolf, for any other reason, you can do so through the Instagram relaxwithanimalfacts or through the email relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. Make sure to follow the Instagram because we have Instagram events in which you can even choose the next episode once a month. We have live quizzes and different things like that, so it is a lot of fun and I look forward to seeing you there. If you want more episodes of the show and you want to support the show, you can join the Patreon Relax with Animal Facts, which is linked in the description. What an amazing creature. I have always heard about the walrus in passing, and it is something that always struck up a bit of whimsy in myself, and so I am glad that we got to cover it today. The facts that were used in this episode come from nationalgeographic.com, wwf.org, resources.arctickingdom.com, oceanwide-expeditions.com, etimonline.com, gifts.worldwildlife.org, and shopnwf.org. All of these are linked in the description of this episode, and if you would like to learn more, I encourage you to explore all of that content, as without them, this episode would not have been possible. I hope that you will join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.